Uh, let me introduce to you uh, our, our bread historian for the symposium, William Rubel. Thank you, Thank you Peter. Thank you. Hear me, is this on? It's on. Great. All right. Let's see. I live in a, a, web, a world of chaos, but um, usually it works out. So Peter's asked me to limit my talk to 20 to 25 minutes, so I'm going to aim for 25 minutes. And um, then the rest questions. I'm going to leave sort of dispelling myths, mystifications, um, fake lore to the question and answer period. Um, I got into bread through story. I was 11 years old, and my mother gave me this two-volume edition of the American Heritage Cookbook. One volume is uh, a picture book history, and the other is recipes with head notes. And um, I was reading through these head notes, and there's one bread recipe, Anadama bread. And, and in it, the, the, the author says that, well, how did the name Anadama come, or, come about? And, and one postulate is that the wife does something, and the husband says, Anna, damn you! I was so excited. Damn, we weren't supposed to say that around the house. I remember going into the kitchen, showing it to my mother. Mom, look, it says damn. Well, I made that bread all through junior high and high school. I was 11 years old. That was my bread. And that got me into bread. I, 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 I found not that long ago a box of papers that I had brought from high school um, <laughs> that I had never opened. And in it, um, I had written about yeast. And I was clearly, when I was 19 years old, already wanting to communicate the story of bread. So I have written a small book on bread. It's called Bread, a Global History, and it's available in the shop, um, the temporary shop, the pop-up. I am currently writing a very big history of bread. It's contracted for something like 135,000 words with UC Press. And I'm late. Um, <laughs> my, my very, very, very wonderful partner just got me an extension to January 15th, which is already an extension on an extension. So sometime, hopefully the end of 2018, um, this book will be, will be published. Now, a great deal of what's written about bread history is nonsense. It's on your websites. There's lots of nonsense. I've looked at a lot of them. In cookbooks is nonsense, in, um, in, in history books. So I'm, I'm the first author who's been very fortunate that every book in English from 1473 till now is online. All the academic papers are online. So I am trying to write a fact-based history that will provide you um, a foundation with which to sort of move forward, understand a lot about the breads we're doing now, but also um, continue researching the history of bread. Now, I know a lot of you, you're deep into your breads. You've thought about them a lot. I don't think about individual breads so much. I'm thinking a lot about sort of bread in general. And what I have found useful to help me in my thinking is the anthropologist from Mars. Um, Oliver Sacks, um, a favorite author of mine, wrote a book called The Anthropologist from Mars. And I thought, well, what a really good idea. So today, by my side, is the anthropologist from Mars. And, and what this anthropologist helps me do is really look um, at us from a very big distance. As an historian, there is no good bread. There is no bad bread. There is just bread. And, and this bread here is, is, is on a par. It's equal to this bread. It's just bread. Now, the anthropologist from Mars has asked me this. I'm a nice guy, but this guy can be a stickler sometimes. He's asked me to remind you that most people in the world who eat bread eat flatbreads. And most people who eat loaf breads eat bread like this. So the breads I think most of us are making and are interested in, and the breads we see up here, are really a subset. And when you get to sourdough, a subset of a subset of a subset, kind of a niche product. I'm dividing my talk into two 
narrative arcs, sort of two histories of breads, because there's millions of histories of breads. Every one of us is a storyteller. The first half, I'm going to talk about breads in general. We're not going to refer to any specific loaf. The second half, I'm going to get more into different ways of thinking about what we're doing. So the first, one of the first history of breads ever written is this passage from Genesis that you all know. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, so thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. I mean, it's a very powerful and one way horrible passage. But that's a history of bread right there. And that was written between 5 and 600 BC. Now, bread had already been around for 7,000 years. Common bread wheat, Triticum estivum, subspecies estivum, already had become the dominant wheat beginning in the early Bronze Age, 2,000 years before this. The pyramids were already more than 1,000 years old. That's when this story was written. And that's not how it happened. There is no garden that we were kicked out of. But there is truth to the story. Because the truth is that when we were hunter-gatherers, we were healthier than we were after agriculture was discovered. We ate a lot of many things, and we never ate a lot of any one thing. So we were very resistant to starvation. But what happened was, once, once we moved from that life to agriculture, there was no going back. And while there may not be four angels protecting a Garden of Eden from us getting back in, we're stuck right now on the outside. And what the real story is that slowly by slowly, we apes, Homo sapiens sapiens, this animal that's us, walked out of Africa. And we are very adaptable, and we walked through the whole world. And like animals do, we fucked. And those little baby apes, they grew up. And some of them survived, they fucked again. <laughs> and generation after generation of fucking little Homo sapiens sapiens got to a point why we couldn't survive on all those little grasses anymore. We couldn't survive on the occasional rabbit. We began to settle down in Southwest Asia, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, a part of the world that is in such a mess right now. About 14,500 years ago, the anthropologists call us the, the, the Natufian culture. And we started increasingly cultivating, harvesting the large grained grasses. And over a period of two or 3,000 years, we ended up domesticating one of them, Ancorn and then emmer. And then once we started growing emmer, we started moving out with that, and we got over towards Iran. And that emmer, it bred with another grass, a goat grass, and it became Triticum estivum subspecies estivum, common bread wheat. And a couple hundred years later, that became spelt, grew out of that bread wheat. And there was barley, and there was rye, and all of these things were there at the very, very beginning. But what they did, what they did is they let us make bread. When you grind the grain, you increase its glycemic index. And when you make it into bread, what's really great about bread is something that Karatas, our speaker, mentioned, is that you can carry it with you. Congress. 
And this is really great if you're going to be a shepherd. It's also really great if you want to have an army and go out and kill people. The armies of the world march on bread. The Chinese army marches on bread. Our armies march on bread. The British Navy sailed from the ports of Portsmouth and London and Bristol and conquered the world on bread. It was ship's biscuit. Now let's rejoin our archaeologists, our anthropologists from Mars, and look down at the world. So this is you know, separating wheat from the chaff, short history of bread. We got the beginning 10,000 years ago. Where's the end? The largest crop in the world by acreage is wheat. Not any old wheat. Bread wheat. Triticum estivum subspecies estivum. Common bread wheat. That's the biggest crop in the world. And when this anthropologist from Mars looks down at the world and sees this, he says, fucking hell, this ape, this monkey, discovered that it could grow this tiny little seed, and with that tiny little seed could build cities and, and create all of this. Mesopotamia was built on bread. The largest early civilization, the Harappan in the Indus Valley, five million people at the same time as Egypt and Mesopotamia, bread. The pyramids, bread. Greece and Rome, bread, and of course, Europe and the world today. You swallow this. <laughs> it's chewy. I need to go to your sensory truck and say, oh my god. It doesn't taste that bad, but this is a very gummy, this is a very gummy bread. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right, the water. Greenland is melting. Antarctica ice cap seems to be unstable. The ocean is acidifying. And all of that is because of this bread wheat. Even today, 25% of the world population, 25% of this ape animal, 25% of our calories comes from wheat, this bread wheat. If you took that away, if it disappeared, 25% of us would die. This bread has enabled this animal to build this amazing place, to be able to stream my voice all over the world instantly. And I know my girlfriend is watching it, my partner is watching it now in London. And we have done that on bread. So when you ask, what is the future of bread, just globally? I think the answer is that if scientists eating bread can work out really quickly how to make it possible for wheat to survive in a warming world, we'll be eating bread in 10,000 years. And if they can't, then we need to look to the authors of science fiction books and people with that kind of imagination to give us a hint of what kind of world we're going to be in. Now for the second part of my talk, I'd like to start with a quote from William Faulkner. He said, the past is never dead. It isn't even past. Now, one problem that we have, us modern people, is we are really immersed in the ideology of progress. Everything's progressing. Everything's changing. Everything is getting, is getting better and cooler. But a lot of things have stayed the same. Yeast. It's the same strain of Saccharomyces cerevisiae for thousands of years, and we've been using it for thousands of years to make bread. The 
the tandoor oven. Those five million people in the Harappa Valley, and even earlier, the Neolithic settlements before that, they had tandoor ovens. And the oldest Neolithic settlements that we've excavated, they all have little domed ovens. We're talking 9,000 years ago. Everybody had a little domed oven in their house. The ovens have not changed. And when it comes to making flour, white flour, as white as snow, the kind of flour we have, that flour we know existed for a couple thousand years. And there's no reason to doubt that even 4,000, 6,000, and 8,000 years ago, using triticum estivum, subspecies estivum, and spelt, you could have made white flour. Whether people did or not, that's another question. But it was technically possible. A lot of things like that have not changed. But what I want to talk about is the past that is inside us the deep, deep, deep structures that are inside these breads, deep structures that, as far as we can tell, have been the same for thousands of years. And when you ask, what is the future of bread? I'm going to talk in this part of the talk about deep structures that are the kinds that, as they change, the breads change. Now, when you're writing history of bread, you're asked all the time, who invented the first bread? Who made the first bread? Who discovered yeast? Who discovered sourdough? And it is really annoying. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure all of you have written books. It's annoying. And, and, and it was annoying. It was also annoying to uh, Thomas Moffat, who was a writer in the 1590s. And, and it's really clear, I think, that he was pissed off about that. Because when he wrote about bread, he said, quote, we cannot know who invented the first bread. You know, just get off my case. But he used that word invented. And for me, that was an epiphany. Bread is an invention. It is an invention of culture. Farmers don't harm, pick breads from trees. They don't scythe breads from fields. They don't dig breads up like potatoes. Bread is a creation of culture, of technology. Everything about the bread is a choice that the baker makes. And the baker, I know you guys, some of you think you work for yourselves, but you work for the culture. That's why these are loaf breads, not flat breads. We're not a flat bread culture. But everything about the bread, what grain you chose, how it's refined, whether it's a loaf or flat, whether it's leavened or unleavened, whether it's big or whether it's small, whether it has uh, a, a, a not very crispy, crispy crust, or whether it has like a, a crust to die for. I mean, I wish I could knew how to make them look like that. I'm, I'm always jealous. But all of those are choices. And of course, as the anthropologist from Mars will tell all of us, who knows? None of those are better choices than other choices. They are simply choices. Now, poor people eat to eat. And rich people, we eat for pleasure as well as just to eat. But we've got enough time to think about pleasure. So I, I want to start. Um, and let's see, what am I doing for time? 34. I had written down here how much more time I'm supposed to have. OK. Um, so one thing is crust, is health. So ideas about health have defined how breads are made for a very, very, very long time. And it turns out that our, um, I'm not going to. <laughs> no self-harm, or you guys. Um, it turns out that, 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 that for hundreds of years, uh, it was thought in Western medicine that crust was not edible by rich people. Poor people could eat it, but we could not. And, and no bread was served with the crust. Um, sorry, Johnson and Wales. So, so <laughs> it's great when you're a speaker. It's like, fuck it, you know. <laughs> anyway, so the crust was chipped off like this. And, and in fact, they would bake the breads to be really, really dark. 
and, and not back in the stone, stone ages, not back a thousand years ago. The most famous American cookbook pre-Civil War was the Virginia Housewife. And in the first edition, she says, and chip the crust off. Is it all right if I do it on this one? It's much easier. OK. <laughs> Damn it. I mean, I know you like just you know, feeling awful. The last example I found in an American cookbook is the 1924 edition of the Settlement House Cookbook for French rolls, of course, the most elite bread. And she explained, the author explains, how you chip the crust off. So things that, 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 that we think of as immutable, like everyone loves crust. Well, they may have loved it, but they didn't eat it. And this is a passage from a, a 1600 English translation of a, uh, of a, of a French book written uh, in, in, in the 1590s. The crust of bread, notwithstanding it be better taste and relish than the crumb, and that the common people do think that it maketh a stronger body. Where are those glasses? Oh my god. <laughs> um, yet it engendereth a choleric, a dust and melancholic juice. And this be the cause why in houses of great personages they used to chip their bread. So the idea was we couldn't digest it, so we chipped it off. We also chipped it off of our racehorses, the breads we served for our racehorses. So when, when right now you know, people tell you I'm gluten, I don't like that, or low carb, this will just put, not the low carb, they don't eat the bread at all. But the gluten people, they're not saying they're not anti-bread. They just are causing us to reformulate the bread. So that's an ancient, ancient, ancient deep structure. Now, I bought this shirt um, for this conference. I, I bought it yesterday at the Gap. <laughs> and I, I bought it because I, I want to talk to you about another very deep structure. Now, there's an American writer, Thorsten Veblen, who wrote a book called Theory of the Leisure Class in 1899. It was published. And he talks about conspicuous consumption, about the idea that, that rich people, <laughs> rich people spend money on stuff that <laughs> doesn't um, work any better than the cheaper stuff. But uh oh, uh oh, here, help. There it is. There it is. So, so okay. So I have. This talk brought, will be replayed on HBO tonight. <laughs> so I, I brought another couple of shirts. Um, I, I wasn't sure really what I should wear. So this shirt, this shirt is a. A Brooks Brothers shirt, and, and, and uh, it was my father's. So my father is with us um, today. And this shirt costs $185. Uh, but, but, but I was thinking, given the crowd and how well dressed all of you guys are, that um, I, I would wear this shirt, which is a shirt that costs about $260. It's a really, really spiffy shirt. Um, and I mean, look at these cuffs. Look at that, guys. <laughs> OK, that's nice. But that's, if you come over here and look at this bread. Uh, wait, I'm going to get you on the mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get back together. I'll, I'll get back together, and sorry. Yeah, I forget. No, I can get back together. Button my, button my shirt up. So, so of course, the idea, Dablin's idea is that, um, that $27 shirt works just the same as this really fancy shirt. But there's a lot of cues in this shirt, and even cues in this uh, Brooks, Brooks Brothers shirt that would tell, tell you that if you're in the know, that it's better. And when you ask the question, like, why, why, and this is what the Martian had asked me, why is it Triticum estibum subspecies estimum that is planted everywhere? Why? Why? And he says, you know, William, you know, you humans are a very socially structured species. You live in big communities, but you striate yourself by social class. And the fantastic thing about wheat of all the grains, because remember, they had einkorn, they had barley, they had millet, they had all these choices. But that's not what we're growing. 
Over 10,000 years, millions of farmers and millions of consumers, billions, decided that what we wanted was that white flour, that wheat that makes white flour, that grain, because that gives you the most subtle distinctions, and we are a people of subtle distinctions. Now, you artisans, artisan guys, I know right now with the white flour, you like a white flour that is more yellow in tint, right? And go to all kinds of lengths, the auto lease, everything, to like not oxidize the dough and stuff. Well, that's very subtle. And that's like, you know, this kind of thing. <laughs> now, the amazing thing is that this cost a dollar and five cents a pound. I bought it at Safeway. And a block away, there's a bakery that sells breads like that that cost $6.50 a pound. And here is the fucking amazing thing. If you multiply 2750, this Gap shirt, by six, that's the price of the Brooks Brothers shirt. This is six times the cost of this shirt. So in the past, people were very upfront that they were making breads for the rich. And in America, you know, we don't talk about that. But as you're talking about the future of bread, I think one thing to keep in mind is that we are making breads for an elite market. And that's great. And that's wonderful. And that's fine. But I think it's important to be honest about it. No, Peter wants me to do questions. So I'm just going to finish up really quickly with sourdough. And this will get a little bit into also myths and mystification. So I said that health was something that drives breads. Well, historically, sour was considered very, very bad. Because before Pasteur discovered germs and the germ theory of disease was developed, gastroenteritis and other digestive problems were associated with sour bread. So right now, we blame our poor people. Don't go to McDonald's. Don't eat that shit. Makes you fat. Your fucking fault. Why do you go there? Well, it's amazing. In the 18th and 19th century, they said, you make your family sick, woman. Because the women made bread. It's very anti-female. You make your family sick. You're making your kids sick and your husband sick with that sour bread. So no rich person wanted sour bread. And in the Anglo phone tradition, in the British American bread tradition, and Canadian and Australian, but in the Anglo bread tradition, there is no sourdough tradition, period. From the first recipes from 1550 until basically now, there are literally two sourdough bread recipes published in English. They just didn't exist. And in France, while there was a Levant, very strong Levant tradition, which, by the way, doesn't say sourdough. They didn't, they formulated the bread so that the bread did not taste sour. The first and most fantastic bread recipe in French is by Nicolas de Bonafont in his Delice de la Campagne, which is from 50, 1654. And when you make that bread, with sour, it's a Levant bread, there's no sour taste because the way it's built, 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 they start with only 6%. Levin. You go to France today, the sour flavor is just starting to creep in. I was at a bakery by um, a, a Kaiser bakery that, where the bread actually tastes a little bit sour. But mostly the French Levin breads don't taste sour because sour was considered bad. And one thing I find really quite extraordinary is France invaded England. Then England owned most of France, or big portions of France, for hundreds of years. They never ate sourdough bread. And all the rich had French cooks. But they never ate Levin bread. They stuck with their yeasted breads. So when we look forward to the future of bread, I think you need to ask questions. Like, why, why is sourdough so interesting to us now? Why, after you know, 
1066, you know, five, 600, 500 years, did the British finally wake up and say, whoa, I want to make bread with Levant, when they had actually actively rejected it for so long. So when we look at these beautiful breads, and we celebrate the bull, but we don't celebrate this one, the same dough. Now, Veblen would say, well, this takes more handwork, right? You just slop it in the pan, and it makes this. All of these breads we make, in terms of deep structures, and I'm going to close with this. Historically, it was flour refinement that was one of the big class distinct distinguishers. And the poor people had giant breads, 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 20 pounds. Not whole, whole wheat flour. We'll get to that in question and answer, but, but less refined than white. And what the rich people had, what we know beginning with the written recipes in 1550s, is they had breads that weighed one pound and on down to smaller rolls. So now where we're all rich, we're all working in the realm of these smaller loaves. But really, it's Veblen again that explains why. You could make a big giant loaf, there's less handwork. It doesn't feel very personal. Everything that you do as bakers, every little extra turn, every little fillip on the crust, every little extra fold, anything you do to it that doesn't change its nutritional component. Because remember, gram for gram, these two breads, I'll pick a more beautiful one, gram for gram, these have exactly the same nutritional quality. So it's a deep structure that we're interested in this one and not this one, because we're human and we're into social stratification. And I know a lot of you, how many of you are into sourdough? How many of you into yeasted breads? A couple, great. But in terms of, of thinking again about the future of bread, I just want to end with this. Yeast has many names in English. And one of them that was common for hundreds of years was God's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now I know how we're going to go viral with this conference. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we want to take some questions. We can take a few questions before we go for our break. Anybody have any questions for William? They're afraid. <laughs> He'll keep his shirt on. He promises to answer. Uh, yes. So this is kind of a tangent, but um, your presentation reminded me of something that I've been meaning to look up. And I heard on a podcast recently that there was a woman who wanted to go back in time as close as possible to the beginning of large-scale subsistence agriculture. Uh, and it was because she said that prior to that, societies were somewhat more egalitarian. And as we switched over from hunting and gathering to more stable food sources, the men who were primarily hunter -gather or the hunters and the women who were gatherers, the men had all this extra you know, testosterone -y things, and it became more patriarchal. Have, is, is there anything to that? Will that, will that be well, in the I, book? Yeah, I mean, definitely there is. And, 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 and um, if you read the next little bit of Genesis, the first farmer was Cain. He's the first bread maker. His brother Abel was the first pastoralist. The bread maker is the first murderer, the first one to lie to God. There were no walls in Eden. He built the first wall. He's credited with, ha credited with having built the first cities. Cain is credited in Jewish tradition with having introduced distrust between people and thus weights and measures. Rousseau identified slavery with bread. And, and, and that's the fact. The fact is the skeletons 
of the hunter-gatherers in Southwest Asia were taller, healthier, fewer diseases than the farmers who followed. And yes, grain allows for um, the consolidation of power in and stratified, um, more stratified cultures. I think that's true.